Hello, this is Catherine from Accelerated Reader, reading books for you. Today, I will be reading Chapter 6 from The Moon and the Magic Box by Michael Ross, illustrated by Magdalena Attic. Before I begin reading, I would like to give a big thanks to the author for sending me this book to read on my channel. In the description below, I've included links where you may find and purchase this book. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Chapter 6 Inside the Magic Box They all had their fill of the pancakes, crispy bacon and maple syrup. Glennis then remarked, Oh my goodness, look at the time. I need to be off. Okay, you guys, you know your lunch is in the refrigerator. That's if you are both at home, of course, but must rush. I will see you later, around seven-ish. Troy and Desmi watched Glennis disappear down the farmhouse road. They then ran over to the barn and up into the hayloft to collect Pangy and the box. They didn't expect to see what they did. The box had gone. Pangy was half buried in hay, and almost on his lap there was one of the Rhode Island red chickens, a very pretty plump one called Jemima. Troy had a name for all the chickens on the farm. What was strange was that Jemima was lying on her side, very much awake, but not moving in the slightest. What's going on, Pangy? asked Troy. There was the customary radio tuning, then a big smiling mouth with lots of gleaming teeth appeared on Pangy's face, and he remarked, Oh, very nice bird. She tells me she is stressed out, so I what you humans call it? Ah, yes, hypnotized her. Look at her now, very happy chicky. And sure enough, Pangy stroked his finger along her back, which seemed to bring her out of the hypnotic trance. Jemima jumped up and happily started clucking and was surrounded by the other chickens who just followed Jemima down the ramp to one side of the hayloft and down to the ground floor, followed closely by Nesbitt, who couldn't believe that Jemima wasn't flapping her wings and trying to get as far away as possible from him. Troy and Desmi wouldn't have believed it if they hadn't seen it for themselves. For now, though, Troy and Desmi were both thinking they wanted to take up Pangy's offer of looking around the box. Was it magical? In what way was is magical? Was it good magic? Was there anything it couldn't do? All these thoughts were rolling around Desmi and Troy's heads. But one thing was for sure, they had built up in their minds that it was possibly some sort of genie's lamp. Well, inquired Troy to Pengi, we would like to take you up on your offer of having a look around your magic box. Yes, 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 we do it now, chimed up Pengi, and then quite suddenly there was more radio tuning and his voice suddenly changed to that of a Russian woman. For no reason Troy or Desmi could fathom at all. Of course, my darlings, I will summon box and I will show you round. Step back, my darlings. When box is here, we will all go in together. Erm, um, inquired Troy. What's with the change of voice to a Russian woman. Oh my darling, 
Kangi said, concerningly. You don't like it? There was more radio tuning, and suddenly there was a voice very similar to Arnold Schwarzenegger's from the Terminator films. Ah, so maybe you like this voice better, suggested Pangi. Well, it was better in the sense how uncannily like Arnold's voice and accent it was. Both Troy and Desby burst out laughing. When they closed their eyes, they could swear Arnold was standing in front of them. Nesbitt had sidled up between them all and started whining. This was becoming all too confusing for him. He didn't know whether to bark or run away. He stood his ground for the time being. Troy suggested to Panky that they go to the farmhouse since Troy's mom was out for the day and use the large living room since it is very private. But of course, at the moment the box wasn't there, it had evaporated into thin air. Pangi, who was able to read Troy's and Desmi's thoughts to a certain extent, suddenly came out with, Ah, so, minor boxy can come wherever I vent, yeah? Let's goes to Halsey. I will make boxy appear. Why, Maggie? Oops, that German for like magic. Quick, but it cannot walk easily unless minor hands you hold, or I am carried. Troy and Desmi looked at each other, then decided that if they each held his hand, they could support Pangi and walk to the farmhouse. But Troy was a little worried. If those idiots from the army suddenly showed up, all would be lost. Then Troy clicked his fingers. He remembered his mom had brought some little play clothes for his nephew who was only five years old. Troy told them his idea, asked them to hold fast, and nipped back to the utility room at the end of the kitchen. And yes, there it was, a large cardboard box full of little play suits. Troy started rummaging through the box. There were cowboy suits, Native American Indian suits, but they all looked a little too long on the leg and would be sure to trip Pangi up. At the very bottom of the box, he found something that had been put in the box by mistake. The prettiest little pink and white girl's dress with lacy white socks and typical girly black shoes. Best of all, there was a girl's wig blonde in color that had been plated on two sides and tied at the bottom with two large red silk bows. The wig looked a little on the large side, but there was an elastic band at the bottom which would usually be used for securing the wig on a child's head by placing the elastic band under the chin. Troy pulled this outfit out of the box and thought, perfect. He bundled it up and ran back to the barn. When he reached the others, Troy proudly held out the little dress and wig, shoes and socks to the others. To Pangi, he had no concept of boys or girls clothes. So that implanted big toothy grin materialized onto his face. When Troy looked at Desmi, she was bent over laughing. Troy frowned and asked her, so what's wrong? Desmi spluttered, but Troy, that's for a little girl. If we put this on Pangi, he is going to look like a suspect girl 
left over from Halloween. I mean, his skin is greeny yellow. And I am pretty sure that wig will be too large for him. And then there are his eyes, especially if they come out on stocks. Again, Desmi couldn't help but laugh. Troy was still frowning, wondering what to do when Pengi chirped in with, Well, no begun hassle for Mitch. Let us do it now. We running out of time, ya? Yeah? So Desmi and Troy began their best to dress Pengi. Remember, this was the first time they had touched Pengi. He was warm to the touch. He also felt slightly scaly, as one would imagine if holding a snake. They managed to slip the dress over his body. Good. They managed to stretch the socks over his funny looking feet. Fine. They even managed to fit his feet into the shoes. Perfect. But the fun started when they attempted to put the plated blonde wig on his head. It was, as Desmi surmised, way too big, but slipping the loose elastic band under what chin he had did keep it in place in a fashion, but wasn't ideal. When Troy and Desmi had finished dressing him, they stood back. They couldn't help sniggering. Pangy looked very comical. He just stood there and looked back at Troy and Desmi and remarked, so, I look like pretty human girly now, yeah? Troy left them and began searching through some shelves at the back of the hayloft. And yes, there it was, a large silver tray used in the past for carrying mugs of teas and biscuits for the farmhands. Troy used the bottom of his t-shirt to polish the tray. When he had finished, it looked like a mirror and went back to Pengi and held it in front of him so he could see what he looked like. Three things happened in rapid succession. Firstly, his eyes came out to their fullest extent on stocks. Then he stepped falteringly back in quick succession and let out a high-pitched scream then fell on his bottom. And as he did, the wig blew forward, the edge of the wig resting on the stalks of his eyes. Does in nine good, I look like human child. Monster, for I'm moment I frightened of myself. But I okay now, let us go. After Troy and Desmi, had composed themselves. They were trying their level best not to laugh again. They each grabbed a hand of Pangi and made their way out of the barn. Nesbitt had been watching all this from behind the safety of a bale of hay, very gently growling under his breath. He now surfaced and was falling behind at a safe distance. And so all three were making their way across the farmyard to the farmhouse. They were making good progress. Although Pangi didn't seem to be walking fluidly, he was lifting each leg straight up and then planting it down on the ground. Also, the fact that his wig was rattling around on the top of his head and sometimes falling forward didn't help much. When this happened, to see where he was going, his eyes came out on their stalks. In retrospect, it may have been a better idea not to dress Pangi in anything, but it was done now, and they made the best of it. Before long, they made it to the farmhouse and into the large living room and undressed Pangi. For a moment or two, Pangi just stood there. Then he started waving his right hand in the air.
In front of him appeared a white misty fog that grew into a large ball. There was a sound coming from within the mist, indicating something was happening. The mist dissipated and there was the magic box in all its glory, still only three foot square. You could see a myriad of small lights of all colors inside the box. Some were flashing and some were not. Ah, Zo! exclaimed Peggy with an expansive sweep of his hand. In you go. Troy and Desmi turned and looked at each other. They didn't have to say what they were both thinking. It was the same. Just the look on their faces said it all. How in the world were they all going to fit in this little black box? Now, Pangi may have been a little alien that lived in the moon, but that doesn't mean he couldn't read Troy and Desmi's thoughts. When he did and saw the looks on his face, he started laughing. It wasn't like any type of human laugh. It was undoubtedly an alien laugh. But if you were to try to associate it with something living on our planet, it could be likened to a chipmunk, but four times as fast. Not only that, but as his laughing grew into a crescendo, suddenly, out of the blue, the whole of his body covered itself with long five-inch hairs. He ended up looking like a furry ball. Troy and Desmi took a step back. Nesbitt ran around one of his favorite armchairs and hid. As suddenly as it started, it stopped, and all the hairs disappeared back into Pangi's body. So sorry, should have told you when I excited, I changed into furry ball. All gone now. So now we go in box. Doggy can come too. It looks small from outside, but inside? Well, we. How you call it? Amazing. Of course, one at a time can enter. Troy first, Aunt Desmi, Aunt Doggy, then me. Secret is to be confident, close eyes, and step in. Got it? Troy and Desmi nodded their heads as Desmi went and grabbed Nesbitt's collar and brought him around. Troy tentatively raised his leg to step into the box. He was very dubious that this would work, so he closed his eyes as instructed and concentrated and stepped into the box. It was bizarre. There was no resistance under Troy's foot. He felt like he was falling, tumbling over and over. It was dark, but with what appeared to be stars all around him. Suddenly, he landed on his feet, and very gently. It certainly didn't feel like he was in a box. It felt like another world. It was huge, so much space. There was a sky and grassy ground. Although the grass was pink in color, he also noticed other multicolored moons in the sky. And there were mountains in the distance, but they were a deep red color. There were trees of sorts, but they were upside down. In other words, there were complicated twisted roots at the top and beautiful red and purple leaves at the bottom. And they were not attached or growing in the ground, but floating just above it. So the trees appeared to be bobbing slightly. Troy felt quite light, so he tried to jump into the air. He shot almost 15 feet in the air, but then drifted down and landed on his feet again. He heard a commotion behind him, and there was Desmi landing. 
shortly followed by a very perplexed Nesbitt, who really couldn't understand what was happening. And it was quite comical to see Nesbitt run hell for leather, but shoot up into the air, do a somersault, and land on his feet again. He did this several times, and each time landed back precisely where he had taken off from. Finally, Pangy arrived. This was a shock too. First of all, he was the same size as Troy and Esme, who couldn't work out if they had shrunk or Pangy had increased in size. Desmi noticed they weren't wearing jeans, t-shirts, boots, etc., but long flowing diaphanous, all in ones that were tied around the waist with a belt covered in sparkly gems. Troy's was all yellow, Desmi's was green, and Pangy's gold. Even Nesbitt was wearing little blue shorts and sporting a sparkly holographic collar. Desmi turned to Pangy and said, What is this place? Where is it, Pangy? When Pangy spoke, that was another big surprise. He had no accent now and spoke as fluently as Troy and Desmi. And it was a deep, rumbling sound. Ah, oh, well remarked Pengi. This is an alternate world that myself and generations of my family have constructed using our thought processes. It is a secret haven. It can only be assessed via the magic box. The magic box was presented to us many millions of years ago by a visiting traveler from another dimension. He had a strange name. He was called Andropelathan, the 118th, a race of aliens that help other worlds, not only in our dimension, but many thousands of others. While Troy and Desmi were trying their level best to get to grips with all this, in the background somewhere, they could hear whispering. They stood still and listened and tried to figure out not only what was being said, but where it was coming from. This is weird, whispered the voice. What's with the trees being upside down? Don't they know how confusing that is to a male dog? And why am I wearing this outfit? Continued the whispering voice. I'm wearing a human suit. We are not meant to wear suits. Humans wear suits, and we wear the coat we were born with. It is all because of that funny looking green thing with eyes that pop out on stalks. Maybe a little nip on his backside might make him not appear so weird. At this point, while Troy and Desmi looked at each other trying to focus on the whispering, they both turned around, looked down, and there was Nesbitt. Have you seen this, Troy? remarked Desmi. Nesbitt is wearing blue shorts. When Troy looked down, he started laughing at the sight of Nesbitt wearing shorts, and the holographic holler had impressions of different sorts of bones on it. Then the whispering voice then said, Yeah, yeah, have a good laugh at my expense. That's not just typical. It's downright rude, I will have you know. The voice was now talking, not whispering. Troy and Desmi noticed Nesbitt's lips moving, as if it were him that had been whispering. No way, stated Troy. Is Nesbitt whispering? What do you think, Desmi? Desmi vigorously nodded her head, agreeing with him. It was me, master, replied Nesbitt. I can understand you, and it seems you can understand me. How weird is that? 
This freaked Troy and Desmi out. They turned to Pangi and shot several quick-fire questions at him, such as, Have we been drugged? Are you a ventriloquist? Is this some sort of sick joke? Nesbitt answered for Pangi. Okay, calm down, you two. Yes, I can speak human. And since I can, I want to get something off my chest. Will you promise never to make me sit and beg in front of your friends for a measly, yucky tasting dry dog biscuit ever again? And don't make them grab my paw to shake it. I may be a dog, but I have feelings as well. Keep stuff like that for a circus animal, which I am most certainly not. Thank you. Troy and Desmi just stared at Nesbitt open mouthed. They didn't say a word. They did, however, Notice that Pangi had a foolish grin, an oversized one, of course, across his face. Nesbitt remarked to Pangi, I don't suppose you have squirrels or cats in this new world we are in? I love a great chase, and frankly, I'm getting pretty fed up with chasing sticks and balls. Please make a note, master. He turned to Troy. And as he did, he winked. Did you see that, Desmi? Marveled Troy. He winked at me. My dog winked at me. I can't believe that. At this point, he turned to Pangi. Erm, Pangi, when we finally get back to where we come from, will Nesbitt be like this there as well? Oh no, I'm afraid not. Everything will revert to how it was. However, your doggy will remember everything, and you will treat him a little differently. He won't understand you as he does now, just the tone of your voice and the usual commands. Behind them, they heard Nesbitt curse, and he was shaking his head. He then started walking towards Troy, sat down in front of him, and began to pant deliberately. Then shouted out as sarcastically as possible. Go on, master. Throw a ball for me, please, please, please. This made them all laugh, but it was time to move on. They were walking down an unusual path, along the sides of which were brightly colored bushes, and hanging from the bushes were sweets of all kinds. It was the smell that attracted Desmi and Troy at first. There were all sorts of sweets, from chocolate to chewing gum. As they were walking along, they all started to rise into the air as if they were walking up some invisible stairs. After a short while, they were level with some lovely-looking fluffy clouds. Pangi mentioned to them that they could walk on the clouds if they so wished, which they did. It was like walking on a big fluffy duvet. It felt so warm and soft. Then out of the blue, an unusual voice shouted out, Hey, careful where you put your feet. It's quite ticklish for me. And from the middle of the cloud, appeared two large eyes, and they were smiling. When Troy shook his foot on a fold of the cloud, the cloud gave a little shudder. That must mean it is ticklish. Pangi then got the attention of them all and pointed into the distance. There was a minute speck becoming larger by the second. It was a bird a little like a seagull, but not white, and not covered in feathers. It appeared to be covered in small pieces of colored paper. It was huge, and landed gently on the cloud, which tipped slightly to one side. Hey, Pengi, darling, how are you? Oh, I see you have some visitors. Wait a minute, 
Is this the human with the home world coordinates in his head? Pangi nodded. Oh my, so pleased to meet you, human. It is wonderful you are helping us out like this. Tell you what, would you and your friends like a little flying demonstration? Of course you would. Come on then, hop on board. Pangi was encouraging them to climb up onto the back of this very unusual bird. When they grabbed the colored paper, it felt more like a material and very strong. It was also very soft to the touch. So they all climbed up and sat around the bird's neck and gripped on tightly. The bird turned around and inquired, are we ready? Then off we go. If you, the reader, have ever been on the bobs or a roller coaster, you will know exactly what Troy, Desmi, and Nesbitt were feeling now. The bird simply stepped off the cloud and aimed downwards. The speed took their breath away. Desmi started screaming, not with pain, but with the excitement of the ride. The wind was ruffling their hair and it was streaming back since they were going so fast. Troy glanced at Nesbitt and burst out laughing. Nesbitt's tongue was out of his mouth and flapping at one side. His ears were being blown backward and somehow the wind was opening up his eyelids more than usual, which gave Nesbitt a very comical look indeed. They were still aiming downwards, faster and faster. Troy was enjoying the ride, but he could see the ground coming up to meet them very quickly. He turned to look at Desmi with a worried look on his face. She had anticipated what he was thinking and shouted out at the top of her voice, Stop worrying, Troy! Enjoy the moment! Woohoo! That was just typical of Desmi. Troy was thinking. She is just not bothered that we could go splat onto the ground. Troy gripped some more. He reckoned they would hit the ground in 10 seconds. At the last moment, the bird pulled up sharply, almost touching the ground. All those on the back of the bird let out an audible, ugh! Oh, as the air was squeezed out of their lungs, and they were now flying directly upwards again, back towards the clouds. Troy again glanced at Dasmi and Nesbitt and thought, what? What are they both doing? Surely not. A high five? Yes, they were doing a high five. I've seen everything now. The bird leveled off and began slowly to fly downwards, back towards the ground. It landed very softly indeed. They all slipped off the bird's back, thanked the bird, which flopped back up into the sky. Pangi remarked that they had better make their way back out of the box. Time can do strange things when in the magic box, and Pangi wasn't too sure the effects it would have now it is on earth. Follow me, one at a time please, insisted Pangi. But before he set off, he went to them all and sprinkled a little sparkly dust onto their heads. We are aiming for that little glitch just to the left of that mini upside down waterfall, ordered Pangi. The glitch was a little upright circle probably six feet in diameter. There was a yellow mist on the inside of the circle. And finally, remarked Pengi, just as you came into the magic box, close your eyes and walk into the glitch and you will be out. One by one, they did as they were told. And sure enough, they were all back in the farmhouse living room. For a few moments, no one said anything. Troy and Desmi glanced at Nesbitt, who was back as before, sitting on his haunches, mouth open and panting. Troy said to Nesbitt, 
Was that fun, Nezzy? Nesbitt stood and happily wagged his tail. Then Troy continued with a smile in his eyes. So fancy going outside, Nezzy. I can throw a ball and you can go and fetch it. Nesbitt just looked at Troy, head cocked on one side, screwed his eyes up a little, then started growling at Troy. Troy and Desmi laughed. Pangy was back to his little alien self and spoke with his Arnold-like German accent. Ah, so, we are back. Good and fun, ya? Yeah? Magic box can do many things. While we were in their box, I had message. Baddies coming. You remember? The dammers? Horrible. They know where I am now. So have to hide. Protect myself. It won't take them long to know you have homeworld coordinates in your head, human. I will have to instruct you how to stay safe. With that, they watched Pengi wave a hand over the box, which started to unravel behind a veil of white mist and then disappear. Pangi went on to explain that the dammers will stop at nothing to get Pangi's homeworld coordinates out of Troy's head. Now they knew that is where they were. It wouldn't just be a case of removing the coordinates, but would attempt to suck Troy's spirit from his soul. It is the dammer's only source of nutrient. Once the spirit is removed, it can never be put back. Pangi handed Troy what looked like a fountain pen. Pangi told Troy it was a mini magic wand, and when necessary, would cloak Troy and anyone else close to him in an invisibility cloak, which would confuse the dammers, but not for long. This little wand is rather special. It came into Pangi's family around six million years ago and was given to them by an alien race called the Travelers as a reminder of their friendship. The Travelers are an ancient race whose sole purpose is to help other struggling alien races. In fact, because we humans have made such a mess with our own planet Earth, we are at this very moment being observed by a Traveler called and Apalathan the 118th, who may step in if pandemics continue, or we continue the abuse of our planet, causing global warming, etc. The wand is very intricate. It is covered in precious metals and jewels. When at rest, it looks like any other precious piece of jewelry. But when its powers are initiated, it forms a connection with the hand of the person using it by forming an electric blue bracelet which surrounds the wrist. From there, a person's thoughts initiate its power, so obviously a thought must be carefully planned and thought out. In Troy and Desmi's case, all they would have to think about is forming a protective invisibility cloak around them. Pangi realizes the power behind this wand, so has already programmed the wand, only to provide this one magical invisibility act. He is thinking of Desmi and Troy's safety after all. With great power comes great responsibility. When the time comes and the wand is not needed anymore, it will simply remove itself from Troy and will make its way back to Pangi, wherever he may be. There was also another huge problem, explained Pangi. Since Pangi and his kind live inside the moon, they are responsible for the upkeep of the phases of the moon, from full to quarter to new moon and so on, and it is the crystals that are vitally important to maintain the moon and keep the moon shining brightly in the night sky. And since the crystals were stolen by the dammers, they need replacing and replenishing 
and until they are, the moon will start to wane to the point where it would lose its luminosity, and all you would see is a black hole in the night sky. So it became very apparent that time was of the essence. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned for chapter 7. Don't forget to like and subscribe. In the description below, I've included links where you may find and purchase this book.